Kadash, Kadash, Holy, 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 Kadash, Kadash, Kadash. All praise to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, upon Shem, on Mashiach, on Shai. We give you praise this day for all of our sins. We pray that you help us not to repeat them. We pray for the Most High Yahweh to be our great, great, great power. There is no deity but Him. He is the owner of everything. We ask for forgiveness of all our sins. We believe in the Most High and in His angels who bring His judgments. We believe in His books and in His prophets. We believe in His Son. He who saves for the Most High, who is Jehovah Shai, in the day of reckoning and in destiny. We believe that goodness and malice are His creations. There is no power greater than Yahweh. Why Yahweh Shai? All praise to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Amen. Shalom, family. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And it reads, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all by Shem, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, giving thanks to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, by Him. Everything that we're doing today and what we should be doing every day is through Him, Yahweh, by Shem, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai. All right, so today's class is called how we as a people condemn the 4th of July. And basically what I'm showing you is how our forefathers shunned the uh, festivals of the pagan and the heathens and how our forefathers in this land, being in slavery, did the same thing. So this date of the 4th of July is the day that the U.S. was emancipated from the claws of England. You know, we always like to think uh, this is the time that we got freed <laughs> from slavery. We got embodied into this uh, Declaration of Independence. We got embodied into the amendments to the 14th Amendment, but we never got freed. We're still entrapped in this society. Uh, if they decided to give us reparations that would free us from the contract of the United States Constitution, the list of amendments, that came after the Declaration of Independence, it's which they will not do. Because when you get reparations, you forfeit everything that you have in this country. You forfeit it. Any liberty, or according to their liberty, any liberty that we get from them will be forfeited. You won't be able to do it. You won't be able to work anymore. You won't be able to have a social security card no more. You won't be able to have a license anymore. Won't be able to drive up and down these streets. Won't be able to participate in anything. You basically are alien if you take reparations in this country. It's written right there in the 14th and the 18th Amendment. It's right in, right, right in there. People don't read it. You will forfeit everything by taking the reparation from this country. Uh, because a new declaration will have to be written for you to be able to come back into this land as a alien or you will probably have to reclassify yourself as an alien try to be, uh, get citizenship again in this land this lie kind of trickled down from us being free it was more like a slogan it was trickled through generation through generation of us thinking that we receive freedom you know however the most High does not want us even celebrating with them on these victories that they've had that are really called holidays today. Their victories are what the holidays are all about. Let's go to Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 1, and it reads, Rejoice not, O Yahshua Allah, for joy as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy power. Thou hast loved a reward upon every 
corn floor. But yeah, the most high is saying that we shouldn't be joining in with infinities following these heathens in their holidays. Let's go to Psalms 96 and 5. Here's another verse. And listen how the most high talks about the heathen and what we're supposed to be doing. Psalms 96 and 5. The Most High says, for all the gods of the nations are what? This is idols. They're all idols. But the Most High made the heavens. So why aren't, aren't people worshiping him? They believe in Mother Nature. They believe in all sorts of things. But do, they don't give credit to the Most High God. Every time you speak, you should be saying, go with the Most High God. Do you know in the nation of Islam, in that particular religion, they speak of the Most High every breath that they speak. And they're not even the children of Israel. They're the children of Ishmael. There's something wrong with that picture. Let's go to, uh, so he said he's the God of the heavens. In other words, praise him. Don't praise anybody else. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. You all know this verse here. Tell all those people that you know out there celebrating and they mention the Bible. Tell them to go to Jeremiah chapter 10. It reads, Hear ye the word which the Most High speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Most High, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the for the heathen are dismayed at them. Fourth of July coming up. They're going to be dismayed. Oh, wow. Look at this. You see that? They're going to be dismayed. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 47. Ezekiel 16 and 47. It reads, Yet hast thou not, not walked after their ways. The ways of who? Sodom and Gomorrah. This is nor done after their abominations, but as if they were a very little thing, thou was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. How 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 are we corrupted more than Sodom and Gomorrah? What makes us different? What can we do that's so outrageous as the children of Israel that's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? I'll tell you how. By celebrating Babylonians or Babylon's victories. Celebrating its holidays. Our people are like, I'm going to do it anyway. You can't tell me what to do. This ain't going to hurt nobody. I'm just going to watch and celebrate the fireworks. We just having fun. All right? I had, to, I had to take a step back. I mean, the scriptures cut you up. Because I was like, you know, maybe it ain't nothing wrong with watching the fireworks. But when you read the scriptures, that's why I said study to show yourself approved every day. Remember what this holiday is all about. Victory over you. They tricked us to think that we was going to get freedom, and we didn't, by fighting against the English in Britain. Verse 48. As I live, saith the Most High, Sodom thy sister has not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. So he's saying that we're more vile than Sodom. And Sodom was lowest of the low. We were just talking about the homosexual agenda last week. And we was talking about how wicked that whole agenda is. But most I saying we're more wicked than that by celebrating these holidays, these idols. You know, we ain't no different than them, if not worse than them. I mean... You know, you sit up here and try to do things your own way in your house and you're going to keep the Sabbath day and then turn around and celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving. You know, the most I can tell you, hey, man, get out my house. You know, you ain't about to change my ways. Those are your ways. You want to do those things. So, yeah, I mean, we didn't write the script. It was given to us. It was given to us by the Most High and the servants. So we got to follow these laws. 
Easier said than done, huh? And individually, the most I see is who's doing what. You know, I can't be the judge of you. I don't know what you're doing. The brother can't be the judge of me. He don't know what I'm doing, but the most I see is it all. The most I ain't with it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 10 and 20. It's a hard pill to swallow, huh? <laughs> but wait till you hear Frederick Douglass. Wait till you hear what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to the Most High. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. See that? That's the Most High. That's what he said. He didn't say that some devils are going to save you. He said they all the curse. When we fell, the scriptures lays out how this nation continually makes merry or celebrates while we're down. In Revelation chapter 11 and 8, it reads, and the dead bodies that we're about to read about is Israel. This is in conjunction with Ezekiel 37, when he said he saw far wide in the valley of death, he saw dead bodies, bones laying out, scattered around. So Revelation 11 and 8 is talking about those dead bodies. And it reads, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Hamashiach was crucified. This is that great city, Mystery Babylon, America. It escaped all the other continents on the earth. It escaped the, the uh, chastisement of England and Britain by this 4th of July when they won their independence away from the European unions. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Who are the dead bodies? These are the slaves that were brought over here. Chattel slavery. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Right? We didn't get a proper burial. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. See that? I'll read it again. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. Thanksgiving is the day of destruction, not of celebration. The Native American Indians fell on that day. On Black Friday, the Native Americans fell. Christmas is the day of destruction for the Israelites in England. Okay, this is when we fell to the European soldiers and so forth. You know, all of these holidays, they rejoice over us. It says, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets, this is the two kingdoms of Israel, right? The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Those are the two prophets because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on earth. What do we torment them with? The law, statutes, and commandments. We're going to read about this brother Frederick Douglass now, and you're going to see how he torments these people on the earth. You know, Frederick Douglass was an activist in the 19th century, one of our brothers who fought for Israel, who are the so-called Negroes and the so-called Native Americans, West Indies. In 1852, he wrote this letter. If you can pull this letter up, Let's go to this letter. Uh, it reads, Frederick Douglass, what to the slave is the 4th of July? What to the slave is the 4th of July? I told you, we're still slaves. You may not think so, but your form of liberty here is getting a job, being able to purchase a little land, purchase the house, you know, being, a ha being able to have something in this land. But this is a strange land. This, that's not freedom. We right next to our, to our neighbors, and that neighbor's right next to their neighbor. That's not freedom. You know, there's no longer any uh, formulated walls. Now it's in the communities. We got walls of communities. Notice that every community got a little brick wall to go around it. 
Then you got the HOAs in those communities. You got the apartment complexes. You got the landlords. You know, uh, you got the projects. You got the uh, what they call housing authority police. You know, you're still in slavery, man. Ain't nothing changed. Nothing changed. So we're going to drop down to the second paragraph. Let's start at the very first sentence so you know who this is directed to. And it reads, and I'm going to read most of this uh, document. So if you brothers and sisters could just be patient and listen to what this brother is saying. Just think, in those days, these orators would sit in a, in a church or a community center for hours talking the way that Frederick Douglass talked. And I'm just going to run through it in less than 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes to an hour. So be patient when I bring this out. And, and if you could just have a keen ear to hear while we're riddling off these paragraphs and try to understand what he was conveying to the people, not only to the people, to the president and to the fellow citizens, he called them, even though he wasn't considered a citizen during that time. All right. So it says, Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, I'm dropping down to the second paragraph. It reads on page one. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. But neither their f familiar faces nor the perfect gauge I think I have a of Corinthian Hall seems to free me from embarrassment. Understand, Frederick Douglass, most of those people that were sitting in there were not us. They were Edomites. The majority of people in there were Edomites besides the servants that were in there. So Frederick Douglass had a attentive audience that wasn't even of his kind, that wasn't even of his race. And I want y'all to see the intelligence of Frederick Douglass by the way that he spoke to these people. He kind of just kind of soothed them into uh, he spoke highly about them, and then he just brought down the hammer. Very intelligent the way he did it. Let's drop down to the fourth paragraph. And it starts with this on page one. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. 76 years, though a good old age for a man, is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three score years and ten is the allotted time for individual men. But nations number their years by thousands. According to this fact, you are, even now, only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. The eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes portending disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressible stage of her existence. Who is she? The mystery Babylon the lady who holds the cup. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom 
of justice, and of truth, will yet give direction to her destiny. Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be sadder, and the reformer's brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. I'm going to start right there. I'm going to drop down to the next paragraph. But as you can see, he's given all these men in this hall reverence, talking about you guys are brilliant. You know, look at this great continent you guys just assembled. And it was 13 colonies then. But Frederick Douglass starts this whole speech off commemorating these guys. And he's still going to do it for a few pages, but I'm not going to read all the pages. I'm going to drop down to the second paragraph on the second page, and it starts with fellow citizens. Fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the association that cluster about this day. The simple story of it is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people was not then born. You are under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. Okay, so why do they call it America the motherland and call it England the fatherland? This home government, you know, although a considerable distance from your home, did in the exercise of its parental prerogatives impose upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as in its mature state of mature judgment it deemed wise, right, and proper. So he's going into where they came from, the achievements they've made since they've been here in America. You know, they came on the Mayflower. There was they, they were a ship of criminals, and they've stride. They've made great strides in order to become a great country here in America. So we're going to drop down. We're going to go to the third page. We're going to drop down to the fifth paragraph. And it starts with oppression. And many of you will uh, recognize this verse that he's about to quote. And he says, oppression makes a wise man mad. You know, that's in Ecclesiastes. Your fathers were wise men. And if they did not go mad, they became resistive under this treatment. All right. So how is he conglomerating them with their wisdom? It's all part of prophecy. He calls them wise men. Look at Obadiah in the scriptures. So Edom is who Obadiah is talking about in the scriptures. And we always consider Edom to be, had tendencies of a snake. Crafty, cunning, engineering as far as trying to bring crimes upon you murder and mayhem you know that was always esau obadiah chapter 1 verse 8 and it reads shall i not in that day save the mosiah even destroy the wise men out of edom and understanding out of the mount of esau and thy mighty men o teman shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. So here's just the Most High talking about, he's talking about Edom. Edom was going to have a certain amount of wisdom that was going to supersede every nation on this earth. And the Most High gave him this wisdom. All right, let's go back to the uh, to the speech here. And we left off with they felt themselves. And it reads, they felt themselves the victim of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from England to America from the crown was born. That's that little horn. It's written in Daniel. It was a startling idea, much more so than we at the at this distance of time regarded. 
the timid and the prudent, as has been intimidated of that day, were of course shocked and alarmed by it. So they came out of the colony of Britain and became another colony. Where is that written in the scriptures? It's written in two places in the Bible. It's written in the book of Daniel. Okay. It's also written in Ezra. And actually, it's also written in Revelation. But we're going to go to Second Ezra in the Apocrypha. I'm going to go to chapter 11. And we're going to go to verse 38. So Second Ezra chapter 11, verse 38. And we're going to read about what we just read in the speech by Frederick Douglass. In the Apocrypha, here thou I will talk with thee, and the highest shall say unto thee, Art not thou that remainest of the four beasts whom I made to reign in my world, that the end of their times might come through them? And the fourth came and overcame all the beasts that were past, and had power over the world with great fearfulness. Now how could all these criminals come from England on the Mayflower, have this great wisdom where they eventually end up overcoming every country on the earth. And that's what it's talking about here. And over the whole compass of the earth, which much wicked oppression, it says, and so long time dwelt he upon the earth with deceit, for the earth hast thou not judged with truth. For thou hast afflicted the meek. Who's the meek? Israel. It's the Native Americans. It's the Negroes who were brought here in slavery, who were slaughtered off their land. All right, this is all prophecy. All these things that have happened already are all prophecy. And uh, it says, For thou hast afflicted the meek, thou hast hurt, hurt the peaceable, thou hast loved liars and destroyed the dwelling of them that brought forth fruit, and have cast down the walls of such as did thee no harm. So it's all biblical. What Frederick Douglass was talking about was all biblical. See that? Let's read the next paragraph in the speech of Frederick Douglass, and it begins on page three with such. It reads, such people lived in, have lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. He's still talking about the Edomites, so-called Caucasian man, and their course in respect to any great change. No matter how great the good to be attained or the wrong to be redressed by it, it uh, may be calculated with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. They hate all changes but silver, gold, and copper change. Of the sort of change, they are always strongly in favor. That's not what they took from the Native Americans. That's how they got rich. They brought us over here to get rich. They brought the industrial industry into effect here in America. Sugar cane, corn, uh, peas, cotton, and sold it all over the world. Let's jump over to page four. And we'll start at the top and we'll read down. And Frederick Douglass is still being light on his audience, but he's gonna flip the he's gonna flip the whole script in a minute. And I just want to read you this to see how intelligent this man was, the way he was conveying this stuff. Page four, the opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but amid all their terror and a frightened vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshipers of property clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a re resolution. <clears throat> and as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day, whose tr transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Resolved that these United Colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. And they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. So technically speaking, after the 13 colonies turned into states, when the states started to accumulate, freedom was supposed to reign throughout the states. There was supposed to be no slavery once it turned over to states when the amendments started to come out. 
But it's, it stayed that way. Slavery was still in effect, even after the 13 colonies. When France gave up the middle, uh, the Midwest, when they gave up Louisiana and Arkansas, they brought slavery to those states. When Louisiana became a state, when Arkansas became a state, when Minnesota became a state, slavery still came to those states. On the West Coast, it was the same thing. When the colonies separated, Texas was supposed to become a state. But they, what they do, they made it into a slavery state. All the way up to California, slavery was still in effect. All the states were supposed to abolish slavery with the new amendments. All men are created equal by the Declaration of Independence. Didn't happen. They kept bringing slaves. Never stopped. It says, resolved that these United Colonies are in a right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded. And today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours. You won your freedom from Britain. And you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. They have not stood true to their Declaration of Independence. Let's drop down to the last paragraph on this page four. And it starts out with the population. The population of the country at the time stood at the insignificant number of three million. The country was poor in the munitions of war. The population was weak and scattered. And the country, a wilderness unsubdued. That's what the West was, a wilderness. There were then no means of concert and combination such as exists now. Neither steam nor lightning had then been reduced to order and discipline. From the Potomac to the Delaware was a journey of many days. I'm on page five. Under these, and innumerable other dis disadvantages your fathers declared for liberty and independence and triumph. Triumphed over who? Over the Native American Indians and the Eng English government. All right, so from there, we're going to skip the rest of page five. We're going to skip the rest of page six. Hold on. Yeah, we're going to skip page six, and we're going to go to page seven. And we're going to drop down to the second paragraph. And the topic of this section is called the evil that men do lives after them. The good is often entered with their bones. All right. So now he's about to turn the whole script. He's about to show you what he's really thinking. He had to lay the platform to get everybody feeling good. Now he's about to bring the funk. And it starts out with fellow citizens. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of national justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? 
who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as an heart. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct. And let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the examples of a nation whose crimes, towering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, bearing that nation in irrevocable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of a peeled and woe-smitten people. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, 
I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on the 4th of July. Whether returned to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or who is not at heart a slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your street, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, artists, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and, above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Well, Frederick Douglass is really specifying the type of men that we were, men and women that we were. Very intelligent, high intelligent, but yet you still consider us less than a, or a horse. Look at Jeremiah chapter two. Jeremiah chapter two in the Bible. Look at what Jeremiah tells us. We're just gonna repeat this based on the curses in Deuteronomy. And so Jeremiah was getting fed up with it. And he said this, Jeremiah two verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home born slave? Why is he spoiled? And Jeremiah is like, when are we going to come out of this captivity? When are we going to change? When are, when are we going to be considered more than a man? 
When are we going to be considered the children of Israel? As we accepted and worshiped the Christian God in this land. I'm going to show you in the history of Spain and Portugal in this book here. And uh, I'm going to go to pages 297 and 298. I'm going to page 297 of this book and it reads here. And it's just one paragraph. It's just proven that we were cast into slavery and they were trying to convict us to become Christians to give up our heritage as Israelites. It says here, page 297 of this book, Letter of the Jews of Spain to those of Constantinople. It reads, Respected Jews, health and grace, know ye that the King of Spain by public proclamation makes us become Christians. Makes us become what? Christians. But we're Jews. We're Israelites. Take away our property, deprives us of existence, destroys our churches, and commits other vexations towards us, which confuses us. And we know not what to do, conformably to the law of Moses. We beg and entreat you to be kind enough to convene a meeting and forward us with all dispatch the resolutions you may therein adopt. So there it is. Page 298, it reads here. It says, uh, Marie from 297 over to 298. It says, Beloved brethren in Moses, we received a letter wherein you inform us of the troubles and misfortunes you suffered. This is in Spain, for which we feel as much as yourselves. Because we were in Spain and we got cast into Africa. Those who didn't want to convert convert to Christianity left. The opinion of the authorities and rabbins is the following. In regard to what you say, that the king of Spain makes you become Christians. Submit to it since you cannot do otherwise. So what happened to Frederick Douglass? He was forced to become a Christian. That's why whenever he speaks about Christians, he always say, your American Christianity. Or he'll say, your churches, your Christianity. He never says that he fully accepted it. Let me go to uh, 327. In the same book. This is page 327, Expulsion from Portugal. This is when we're in Portugal. It reads in the first paragraph, it says, He ordered all the sons of Jews under 14 years of age to be forcefully taken from their parents that they might be instructed and initiated in the Christian faith. So you had to give up your faith as being a Jew, an Israelite, you had to give up the law, statutes, and commandments to, to, to go into Christianity and learn an empty religion. It's empty. going to drop down to the last chapter or the last paragraph on page nine the last paragraph on page nine and it starts with what what am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes to rob them of their liberty to work them without wages to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men to beat them with sticks to flay their flesh with the lash to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, 
to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters? Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? They that can may. I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced.
drink to treat. Depended. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 13. Thou should have not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou should have not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in that day of distress. For the day of the Most High is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto you. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Most High will bring judgment. Ain't nothing we can do to stop this. What has happened has already been sealed in the earth. The Most High is going to reveal it. He's revealing it now. Second paragraph it reads. nation. Pledged. Isaiah chapter 14 talks about how these people who took this land, how they're going to perish in these graves here in this land, thinking that they're in a better state. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 16. Because, you know, Esau thinks this is his land. He stole this land. Why would he sleep in peace here? 
Why would he rest in peace with an evil heart going to the grave? And now how they quickly forget about what has happened here in this country. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16. Isaiah 14 and 16 it reads, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, and did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nation, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Talking about these men here. Let's jump over to page 13. And we're going to stop, start at the top. It says, Remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner. And look what else is linked to the Star Spangled Banner and American Christianity. So, what are they going to be celebrating tonight? The Star Spangled Banner. And what is tied to that Star Spangled ba Banner? Caesar Borgia. American Christianity. Where these go, may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. See that? Well, you see that flag? He said, man ain't sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. But that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men, not for thieves and robbers, enemies of society merely, but for men guilty of no crime. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. They were hunting us down. Your president, your secretary, your state are lords, nobles, and ecclesiastics in force as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God, Baphomet, that you do this accursed thing. It's like it. Not fewer than 40 Americans have within the past two years been hunted down and without a moment's warning, hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Now, it says uh, not fewer than 40 Americans. Now, these are free men. They ain't talking about the slaves who are not free that ran away. These are free men, all right, that was hunted down and cast back into slavery. Think about that. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread. You see that? Only a free man could do that. But of this, no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men, there are neither law, justice, humanity, not religion. See that? We didn't stand a chance in this country. But yet we still want to stay here. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. So it was a whole, it was a whole tricks in the rabbit, rabbit's hat. It was a game. You know, they were sending these uh, free men back into slavery. And there's a movie called that, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, brother was free and they caught him, put him back in slavery, sent him down to Louisiana from the East Coast. I think 14 years as a slave is the name of the movie, if I can remember right. Um, I'm gonna drop down to let this damning fact be perpetually told, let it be thundered around the world, same paragraph, that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic, Christian America, there it is again, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe. 
and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty, they're only his accusers. Let's drop down to the last paragraph on page 13. At the very moment that they are thanking God for the enjoyment of civil and religious liberty and for the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences, they are utterly silent in respect to a law which robs religion of its chief significance and makes it utterly worthless, talking about Christianity, to a world line of wickedness. It's these wicked people. Psalms chapter 50. Let's go there real quick. Psalms 50 and verse 16. Look how this links up with the scriptures. It says that uh, the judges make these bribes and they uh, take the sides of the accusers, right? Psalm chapter 50, verse 16, it says, But unto the wicked, the Most High said, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou should have taken my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hateth instructions through the laws out the window, and casteth my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. See that? It's what we just read in the speech. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sitteth and speaketh against thy brother. Thou slandereth thine own mother's son. He's slandering Jacob. That's what we just read in the last paragraph on page 13. Let's go to page 14. This is another catch. Check this out. They came out with a fugitive law. You ever seen that movie, The Fugitive? But Harrison Ford, check this out. Uh, we're going to start with did, first paragraph. It says, did this law concern the mint, anise, and cumin, abridge the right to sing psalms, to partake of the sacrament? This is still Frederick Douglass talking about 4th of July. Or to engage in any of the ceremonies of religion, it would be smitten by the thunder of a thousand pulpits. <laughs> a general shout would go up, from the church demanding repeal, repeal, instant repeal. And it will go hard with the politician who presumed to solicit the votes of the people without inscribing this motto on his banner. Further, if this demand were not compiled with another Scotland would be added to the history of religious liberty. Pay attention now. And the stern old covenanters would be thrown into the shade, talking about what happened in Scotland, talking about those pastors over there. Uh, a John Knox would be seen at every church door. John Knox was a reformer in Scotland during the 14th century. He was like a uh, Martin Luther. They fought for um, freedom of speech when it came to the scriptures. A John Knox would be seen at every church door and heard from every pulpit, and Fillmore would have no more quarter than was shown by Knox to the beautiful but treacherous Queen Mary of Scotland. The fact that the church of our country, which fractional exceptions, does not esteem the fugitive slave law. Pay attention to that. Fugitive slave law. As a declaration of war. Queen of, the Queen of Scotland would be mad at this law. As a declaration of war against religious liberty implies that the church regards religion simply as a form of worship and empty ceremony. See that? and not a vital principle. Why is it empty? Because they don't have any laws, statutes, commandments, nor do they adhere to it, nor do they adhere to righteousness of the scriptures. So it's an empty ceremony. It's like the rest of these churches. And not a vital principle requiring active benevolence, justice, love, and goodwill towards man. So why would she be mad at the fugitive slave law? Do y'all know y'all Bible? Do y'all know how we dealt with slaves? If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, let's look at how we dealt with slaves. You know, in this country, if a slave runs away and a slave catcher catches him or another uh, plantation, the slave runs to another plantation, that slave owner will either keep him, put him back in slavery or take him to the guy that he ran away from. But look at what the scripture says. Let me show you. Let me show you America's evil. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15. Deuteronomy 23, verse 15. It reads, Thou shalt not deliver unto his master 
the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. You see that? So if you had a slave that ran away, you didn't go after him. If he didn't want to be there, you let him go. He shall dwell with thee, even among you. If he choose somebody, like Frederick Douglass chose to be with that uh, sister, that mistress, that Edomite mistress that had sympathy for Frederick Douglass and his people, that was okay. He shall dwell with thee even among you in that place which he shall choose, and one of thy gates where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. But no, they came up with a fugitive slave law to send him back into slavery when he didn't want to be there. This is why America is going to pay for all the actions that they did. All the descendants of these people that had us in slavery are going to pay. Think about um, Abraham. And think about the servant that decided to stay with Abraham, Eliezer. He, just, he wanted to stay with Abraham. He didn't want to leave. He was a servant. He even decided to let the Most High bless Eliezer with his seed, with Abraham's seed, because he couldn't have any children with Sarah at a young age. They said, use my servant, Eliezer, because he, he wanted to be with Abraham. It's a difference. Here in America, they used a continual stroke to put us back in slavery. They're going to have to pay for all of that. They ain't paid for it yet. They still got companies. They still ruling the world. They're going to have to pay for that. On page 14, first paragraph. It reads, it esteems sacrifice above mercy, psalm singing above right doing, solemn meeting above practical, practical righteousness, a worship that can be conducted by persons who refuse to give shelter to the houseless, to give bread to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and who enjoin obedience to a law forbidding these acts of mercy, is a curse. Not a blessing to mankind. They didn't feed us in some of these plantation homes, man. A lot of us was eating sugar cane on those sugar cane plantations because we weren't getting fed when we went home. Especially if you didn't bring in your portion of cotton or your portion of sugar cane, they would use that as a reprisal and be like, look, I ain't give you nothing. You ain't eating nothing tonight because you didn't bring in enough. They would do stuff like that. That's wicked as hell. It says, but the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. So we just read in Psalms 50. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery and the shield of American slave hunters. Many of its most eloquent divines who stand at the very lights of the church have shamelessly given the sanction of religion and the Bible to the whole slave system. We just read about with the Spangled Banners is linked with American Christianity. They have taught that man may properly be a slave, that the rela relation of the master and slave is ordained of the most high malarkey. That to send back an escape bomb to his master is clearly the duty of all the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't say nothing about that in the Bible. And this, is, and this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world for Christianity. Well, Frederick Douglass is talking about talking about how bad Christ, American Christianity is. He said it was wicked, wicked, wicked. Let's drop down to the last paragraph and we're going to go to it is a religion for oppressors. <laughs> but it is a religion for oppressors. We're going to go there. It's in the middle of the paragraph on the bottom of page 14. It says, it is a religion for oppressors. What is that? Christianity. Tyrants, man-stealers, and thugs. It is not that pure and undefiled religion, which is from above, and which is first pure, then peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, but a religion which favors the rich against the poor, which exalts the proud, above the humble, which divides mankind into two classes, just like it is today, it ain't changed, tyrants and slaves, which says to the man in chains, stay there, and to the oppressor, oppress on. 
It is a religion which may be professed and enjoyed by all the robbers and enslavers of mankind. It makes God a respecter of persons, denies his fatherhood of the race, and tramples in the dust the great truth of the brotherhood of man. All this we affirm to be true of the popular church and the popular worship of our land and nation. A religion, a church, and a worship which, on the authority of inspired wisdom, we pronounce to be an abomination in the sight of God. This is what Frederick Douglass is saying. This place is wicked. Wicked. All right. In the language of Isaiah, the American church might be well addressed, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble to me, I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood in capitals. Cease to do evil. Let's drop to the next paragraph. It says, the American church is guilty when viewed in connection with what it is doing to uphold slavery. But it is superlatively I looked that word up, it means to pass all others, pass everything else. So it surpasses all guiltiness when viewed in connection with its ability to abolish slavery. of the nation public discourse believe that of one blood God made all nations of all men are created equal
people right. It saps. This crime Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. This is Frederick Douglass talking about the plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and the Most High have remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double, how much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Most High Yahweh who judge of her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall be well her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Stand afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. See that? And with that, I'm going to end this class. But as you can see, our brother Frederick Douglass was heavily endowed in the scriptures and he knew right from wrong and he knew that the law of the most high still stood quoting some of the things that he said in this letter he believed in the most high he believed that we were the people of of the most high and he knew that these people that were ruling in judgment were not the people of the most high but were going to receive damnation <laughs> This is the word of the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pastures and from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have destroyed all the enemies in your path. I will make you a great name among the great ones of the earth. I will assign a place for my people in Israel. There I will plant them and they shall dwell in their own land. 